teacher's language, that they're here talking about a trainee teacher's language awareness task. So the, the, te- the trainee teacher was asked to uh, do some sort of language awareness task, and then the trainers were commenting on that, discussing that task and commenting on it. Um, and what's interesting is how they immediately, or not immediately, but quite early on in their conversation, they orient to notions of correctness. Okay, so they're asking the question, is that wrong? So they're, they're looking at here, the speaker is reading from the task, from what the student teacher has said in the task. Um, and they're asking the question, well, is that wrong? What are you highlighting? And we th- need to think about what we need to highlight. And you've got wrong, unidiomatic, and then finally towards the end, okay, a more, I th- so the, 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 the trainer is offering an alternative way of writing what the student teacher had written and saying that this would be a more native way of expressing that. So you've got all the way, running all the way through this conversation, this very strong orientation to notions of correctness, okay? And we can contrast that with the following conversation. This is a conversation between a group of experienced, so another focus group, part of the same study, but this time with experienced teachers. And here they are discussing the word curiousness that had been produced by one of the students in a class that this T1, the first teacher, is referring to. And there's quite a long discussion about what do you do as a teacher when a student produces a language item that is non-standard, but is nonetheless successful in achieving communication, that is communicative, in other words, that is successful use of language. And then the, the, the conclusion that they seem to arrive at is that actually it was good that the student came up with this word because the word did its job, it was effective. So we can contrast the two of orientations to language. In the first, it's focusing very much on what is correct or or how the language might be modified in order to make it more standardized. And then in the second, you've got much more of an emphasis on what is communicative. So it's much more of an ELF, what would be an ELF aware perspective on on, uh, language and the outcome of language in communication. Now, what's interesting is that in the first conversation, we've got teacher educators speaking, and in the second, we've got language teachers. So the, the teacher educators have less, seem to have less awareness or be displaying less awareness of ELF, of an ELF perspective than the teachers who are not teacher educators. All right. Now, I think we can explain this because of the, as a, a, a consequence of this very corrective orientation to language in ELT that I've talked about before. And here I'm quoting Michael Long, who is talking about focus on form. So this is a methodology, so it's a a discussion of methodology and task-based learning and teaching. Okay, and what Long says is that focus on form involves reactive use of a wide variety of pedagogic procedures. Okay, good, so far so good. So this is what teachers do. Um, when they react to student output. But then, very quickly, we move to drawing learners' attention to linguistic problems in context. And I think this is very characteristic of what the teacher educators are doing in that first conversation I showed you, the first focus group, um, and their their orientation to the language in a sort of corrective manner. And you see this in the literature quite extensively. So interactional feedback and the way interactional feedback is talked about in teacher education literature is very much um, in line with this way of thinking about language. So feedback is nearly always described in in a corrective way and students, uh, student teachers are trained to deal with, quote, communication or linguistic problems. So student language is seen as problematic. So in other words, what we get is feedback in ELT being characterised as form focused. So the feedback is what a teacher provides as a result of problems or erroneous language use as this occurs in interaction. By contrast, we could say that an ELF aware approach or an ELF informed approach to interaction or to feedback would be much more interaction focused. So here the teacher should be providing commentary and support on forms and strategies that facilitate meaning construction and intelligibility and interaction. So in that first, I think in the first, so in that first conversation I showed you 
what you get is a is very much a form focused orientation to language use. And in the second one, you get much more of an interaction focused one. And I think the key question is, how do we develop teachers awareness and really importantly, teacher educators awareness of what's in what the second perspective entails, adopting this interaction focused approach. Um, now, Telma yesterday was talking about the um, national curriculum in Brazil and how this now includes reference to ELF. Um, and I've, I've made this point before in the past, the, the Cambridge Teaching Awards, the syllabus specifications for Cambridge Teaching Awards include reference to ELF and have done since 2008 or 2009. This is the most up-to-date version of the syllabus specifications from 2019. And you can see there reference to English as a global language, world English is, and English as a lingua franca as part of the indicative content of one of the modules of this teaching award. So it's a, an in-service teaching award, but what's really important to, to raise awareness of here is that this reference to ELF and Global English is, appears in the syllabus specifications under this heading, language systems and learners linguistic problems. So what we have is ELF in name, but not ELF in concept. Right, so you've still got, even when there is reference to ELF, it's still from a corrective perspective. Okay. Now, I think what's really important to highlight among teachers when developing awareness, when trying to promote awareness of this, is the extent to which we are accustomed to referring to or deferring to authority in language. And here, here I'm quoting from uh, quite an influential book in sociolinguistics, Milroy and Milroy's um, authority in, in language. Um, and the point they make is that um, a person who speaks English perfectly effectively, but who has occasional usages that are said to be substandard. So we often think about uh, non-standard usages as substandard ones, um, may well find that his or her, <clears throat> excuse me, social mobility is blocked and may, for example, be refused access to certain types of employment without any official admission that the refusals depend partly or, ho or wholly on his or her use of language. So <clears throat> our attitudes to language and the ideologies underpinning those attitudes can have really uh, damaging consequences on individuals if they do not speak the prestige variety. Um, and what's, what's really troubling from our point of view, uh, from people researching language and linguistics is that the, another point that Milroy and Milroy make is that the attitudes of linguists, which they interestingly define as professional scholars of language, yeah, have little or no effect on the general public who continue to look to dictionaries, grammars and handbooks as authorities on correct usage. So it's not just something that we see in ELT, yeah, this corrective orientation to language. It's a really pervasive way of thinking about language. And I think that, that has a really strong influence on language learners and language teachers. Okay, so we, we are accustomed to deferring to authority in language. We learn this behavior at a very young age, right? So we want dictionaries to tell us what to, what's the right word, what's the correct word, what's the correct usage, and so on. And the point that they also go on to make is that where dictionaries uh, where lexicographers do attempt to remove traces of value judgment from their work, this is not um, this is not widely accepted. I'd right? say so that the Webster's Third International Dictionary in 1961 didn't include these kinds of value judgments and was described, according to Milroy and Milroy, by one critic as a a scandal and a disaster. In other words, we are so used to making these value judgments about uh, language. Um, and so used to deferring to some kind of authority, some kind of established authority in language, that we complain about it when we don't see it. Yeah, that we want dictionaries to tell us what's correct usage, what's not correct usage. And that's, that's quite, then quite challenging to move from that to thinking about language in a different way. Sorry, the, the lighting has changed quite dramatically in my room. Bear with me for a moment. Okay, that's better. I couldn't, I couldn't see my end screen. And you probably saw me flooded in light. I'd say, so I think this, this, so this 
deferral to to authority or willingness or even expectation to defer to authority in questions about language is the result of dominant language ideologies. Now, language ideologies are shared by groups. So in other words, they are socially learned. They affect people's behavior, often in subconscious ways. And I think this includes language teachers and teacher educators. We might be influenced by language ideologies without even realizing that we're being influenced by them. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the key point here also is that they relate language ideologies, <clears throat> connect with power and inequality. The maintenance of inequality is often something that, that occurs through expressions of attitude towards language and orientations to language in our institutions. The other really key point to make here is that beliefs about language are acquired early in life and so therefore are less amenable to change in later life, which is why it can be such a challenge to engage in a different way of thinking about language in language teaching and teacher education. So what we have is, <clears throat> I mean, <clears throat> okay, sorry, we're going back this point. So the, I mean, Eleanor Shahami has talked about this as a, a form of control. Yeah. By imposing the use of certain languages in certain ways, in other ways, in other words, ways that are correct, pure, native-like, and grammatical, yeah, they govern the way and the right to use language. And I think this has been very, very influential in the way teachers have learned to think about language and have learned to react to language. So a key point that I that I try to make in my teaching when uh, working with teachers and encouraging them to try to think differently about language is making them aware of the need to engage in critical reflection, the need to think critically. And one way I, I've uh, started to do this recently is by uh, referring to Stephen Hawking. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, when Stephen Hawking died in 2018, um, I started rereading A Brief History of Time, his Fame, a very famous book from 1988, which I read not long after it first came out, when, of course, I wasn't interested in linguistics and didn't have this particular perspective that I'm talking about now. So I reread this uh, following his death. Um, and this is what I was very surprised to read. Well, not, I wasn't very surprised to read this. Yeah? So, so one, of the, one of the points that he makes quite early on in his book, is the discovery that the universe is expanding was one of the great intellectual revolutions of the 20th century. Okay, nothing necessarily very uh, surprising about that. But the point that he made was that with hindsight, it's easy to wonder why no one had thought of it before. So Newton and others following Newton should have realized that a static universe would soon start to contract under the influence of gravity but didn't, it took until the 20th century. So Newton was working in the 17th century, right? Um, and the, Hawking explains that this behavior of the universe, even though it could have been predicted from Newton's theory of gravity at any time in the 19th century or the 18th century, or even at the end of the 17th centuries, the point is so strong was the belief in a static universe that it persisted into the early 20th century. Now, even Einstein himself, when formulating the general theory of relativity in 1915, was so committed to this idea of a static universe that he modified his theory to make it possible. So he adapted the theory to fit his belief in a static universe. Um, <clears throat> so bearing in mind that Newton was writing, writing this in, in, towards the end of the 17th century, it's very surprising to think, or, or it's, it's really worth noting, to think that um, it took 200 years for this theory, even though we had all of the evidence available from this theory, to discard this belief in a static universe. We didn't do it. It took almost 200 years for that to take, or more than 200 years for that to take place. But what does this have to do with English and English language teaching and health? Well, it's about the conviction we have in our beliefs, particularly beliefs in something that is firm and static and unchanging. That seems to be much easier for the human mind to grasp 
I think. What it requires to move beyond that is a very critical stance, a very critical perspective on language, and therefore a very critical perspective in teacher education. So <clears throat> critical practices in teacher education, Hawkins and Norton tell us, this is not Stephen Hawking, this is Hawkins, very different person, of course. Um, the critical practice in practices in teacher education promote in teacher learners a critical awareness, a critical self-reflection, and a critical and critical pedagogical relations, all of which are crucial. So in critical awareness, we need teachers to develop an understanding of how power relations are constructed through language. And in the case of ELF, critical language awareness is essential because of the ideological nature of language values and attitudes that really needs to be addressed explicitly and at some length. Um, <clears throat> in terms of critical self-reflection, teacher education provides needs to provide opportunity for teachers to develop critical perspective in a way that will encourage them to reflect on their own beliefs, assumptions, and the way these are positioned in society, which is essential if teachers are to find their voices and create some space for individual pedagogy. And central to this notion is the concept of praxis, or to the interaction, integration of conceptual knowledge and practical activity. So where you have action leading to reflection, and then that reflection leading to transformative action. So you get a reflective cycle, but a reflective cycle that is informed by challenging uh, critical questions. And really important as well, and something that, uh, that's informed my work in teacher education is that this requires us to adopt a socio-cultural perspective, right? So we want to take theory and develop concepts and theories, but in a way that relates in, concrete, in a concrete fashion to the practical activity of the classroom, connecting these theories to teachers' everyday knowledge and activities. Right, so a sociocultural approach is crucial. Um, and what I'm going to talk about now is how I've gone about doing, trying to do that in my teacher education. So if, I have mentioned this a uh, couple of times before in my talks. I think uncovering language myths with uh, language teachers, both novice teachers and experienced teachers, is a really useful starting point for trying to initiate some critical reflection in language teacher education. And I, I often make reference with my students to um, an edited book by Laurie Bauer and Peter Trudgill called Language Myths. And I, I, one of those language myths is that meanings of words should not be allowed to change. There's a, a, a very interesting TED talk on this notion, but then I extend that and say, okay, here are these language myths that in sociolinguistics have been discussed in the past. Let's, let's extend those and go <clears throat> um, take that thinking, take that way of thinking of trying to uncover myths about language and relate that to an elf perspective on language. So I present these um, statements to students and say, I think that uh, these are questionable statements. I think we can challenge our thinking in relation to each of these statements and question what it is we believe and question what it is we do in the classroom as a result of those beliefs. So, and that they, they are deliberately designed, some of them to be quite provocative. So standard English is more intelligible than non-standard English is. Is this a, is this a, is there any truth in that or is it a myth? And so on. Native speakers provide appropriate language models. And I'm, I always argue that no, each, there's no truth in any of these. Obviously that the extent to which there is truth in them is open to discussion and debate. And that's part of what the focus of, of uh, introducing these uh, concepts as myths is intended to achieve, okay, and so on. And then I encourage teachers to provide their own examples of beliefs about language that might be questionable from an ELF perspective. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do now briefly is show you some discussion tasks that I use with my students that are designed to promote, again, promote this way of thinking. And this is where I'd like to come back to what Kurt was talking about on Friday, when he said that we need to normalize the complexity of ELF. And I think very often as language teachers um, and teacher educators, it's, it's easy to overlook 
teachers' beliefs and um, relationships with their with all of the languages in their linguistic repertoires. Okay, so I've I've started using a number of discussion tasks that before asking students to think about English, ask them to think about their own language. Okay, so how easy is it for you to describe your accent? Has it changed over time? Is it different from your parents' accent? So getting teachers to engage in, in um, ideas about linguistic diversity, awareness and understanding of the importance of linguistic diversity, but from their first language perspective, first of all, and then extend that out to English. So, so for example, asking students together to discuss whether they ever change the way they speak, uh, when do they, if they do, who do they do this with? Does the topic that they're talking about have an influence on this? Does the context and setting have an influence? What's the relationship between affective and emotional factors and the different ways of speaking that you have in your first language? <clears throat> Okay, and we think about this, discuss this in relation to concepts of structure and action, to what extent individuals have freedom to choose the, their ways of speaking. All right. And here's a, a, a very short extract from a recent conversation that two of my students had in response to this question of their own accent. And these are both of these students are enrolled on an MA programme at King's College London, and they're both from China, uh, different parts of mainland China. And they're talking about, the, they, they have a conversation both about the different ways they have of pronouncing English and the different ways they have of speaking in Chinese. And there's quite a lot of awareness of the importance of social identity, um, of community, of different regions of China, having different ways of speaking and how that's influenced the way they've used Chinese. And then in as a consequence, how that's influenced the way they think about language in the classroom. And you see, what you see when you ask these questions about teachers in relation to their own language use or their own languages and language use is they, they soon start to think about this in relation to pedagogy. It doesn't take much of a move from discussing their own experience of language to then go on to talk about what it means in the classroom. The I also have um, <clears throat> each week for the, the teaching that I do in teacher education, I have a focus on, I have a key reading, core reading, usually one or two texts. And I ask the students to engage in, in questions in, a, in a, um, an online discussion forum before my lecture. And this is one particular article that I asked them to read um, because it's an article that discusses ELF um, and talks about alternative approaches to modeling English for teaching this in this instance it's pronunciation teaching um, <clears throat> and then I what's really important is I highlight once they've they've had their discussion online we then go to the live uh, in the live lecture we didn't used to call lectures live did we in the um, in the lecture um, we then I then go through the article showing sections that I've highlighted that I think might be problematic um, and that need critical engagement. And here's just one from that particular article. So this is one reading from one week on a, mod on a 10 week module where we talk about this stuff. Um, <clears throat> and this is just one article, but it's a really, it's, it's, it's just easy to, to demonstrate to students how important it is to engage critically. So, and the point I make is that if this is the first time you've encountered the concept of ELF, and you were reading this article, essentially what you're reading is a slight misrepresentation of ELF research activity. So there's an article by uh, Chepek Reed, who is in fact my head of school at King, so he's a colleague of mine. Um, and she talks about the progress of, in research activity in ELF, but refers to ELF quite uh, in, several times in the article as a variety of English which as a variety of English, okay, which of course, as many of you will be very aware, has something that is something that's been controversial. We've challenged that assumption that um, ELF research is about identifying a different variety of English. So the, the way we conceptualize ELF in relation to variability is very, very different from ways of thinking about variability from say a world English's perspective where it's all about sort of codifying localizations. Yeah, so, so it's an article that 
at first glance, you think, well, this is really relevant from an health perspective, but it also requires a critical, it requires critical reflection. Yeah. Um, here are some examples of questions that the students have posted recently in their discussion forum following these readings. This is, this is, remember, this is one of several readings in a 10 week module. Um, and these are the kinds of questions that students post to each other in their discussion forum. So they start thinking about all of, all of this discussion. What does it mean in a practical sense? So we get very critical. And I think these are evidence of critical reflection, critical thinking about language and language teaching practices. So for example, how can we improve our students' tolerance for linguistic differences and make them more aware of how our language use can be used to express identity or establish a sense of community? So these are ideas, these are questions that I've asked them and they're thinking about linguistic differences and linguistic diversity, perhaps much more than they have done in the past. And they're now thinking about this from their students' perspective. Okay, and you get, you, you get some very interesting discussions emerging from these forum posts. So what I typically do in the lecture is take up, pick up some of these discussion forum questions and then have a, a debate in the class about them. So there's a lot of discussion about the relationship between the languages that we speak, our perceptions of languages and what that means for the language classroom. So trying to promote much more diversity. I also spend some time thinking about what this means in relation to um, discrimination and prejudice, just to reiterate for the students how important it is to adopt a critical perspective. Um, <clears throat> many of you will, will, excuse me, many of you will have seen me quote this before, but this is um, from uh, a, a case study of uh, Priya who identifies as Anglo-English, but who, who grew up speaking English as her first language. English has always been her dominant language, she refers to it as her mother tongue. But when arriving in the UK was asked to take an IELTS exam in order to be accepted at a UK university. She was not given a place in the, she was given a conditional offer, conditional on English language requirements. So despite having uh, grown up with English, she was asked to do the IELTS test, okay? Um, and and quite, quite understandably, she describes this as an experience of discrimination <clears throat> and, and, and uh, prejudice. And I think, obviously, this is a really clear example of how language ideologies can have quite uh, damaging consequences and why it is essential that we engage in critical thinking about these ideologies and how they have influenced the way we orient to language in education. Um, and very similar idea uh, in, in a separate case in the same study. So this is uh, Neelam who is from India and describes herself as a Marathi speaker. So Marathi is her mother tongue. That's the first language that she learned at home, but she's now more proficient in English. So English is her dominant language, okay? And even though English is her dominant language, She's reluctant to identify as a native speaker. When other students on her MA program say that she's a native speaker, following, what's interesting is, this is following a session on global Englishes where we're discussing these issues of who can identify as a speaker of English and who doesn't identify as the speaker of English, whether or not the label native, non-native is useful. So she talks about not wanting to describe herself as a, Sorry, that was my timer. To not describe herself as a native speaker. And this relates quite strongly to her orientation to the way she speaks in the language classroom. So she talks about not liking her pronunciation, not wanting to use her own pronunciation as a classroom model. Okay. So she, she, she talks about liking her accent, being happy that she has an Indian English accent, but not being willing to say that that's the way I'm going to model English in the classroom. All right, so in, in summary, um, and to go back to what I was saying before about how I was trying to see connections with other speakers in the conference, we can say that native speaker English itself is not a problem, but native speaker Englishes do have very strong gravitational pull. If we want to think back to Stephen Hawking. 
and continuing to promote a native speaker model inevitably leads to, leads to native speakerism. Um, I also think that in order to expand our thinking and thus expand the options available to teachers and their learners, we need to overcome the, this force, this gravitational pull that native speakerist beliefs have. And that requires quite, quite considerable critical awareness. Um, the, uh, going back to what Barbara was saying on Friday, yes, ELF, I mean, ELF has emerged as the consequence of natural evolutionary processes. That's very, very easy to argue. And yes, I agree we need evolution and not revolution. Evolution because it has to be gradual and it, it takes time, it takes investment. But some of our attitudes towards language require quite a revolutionary turn. They require a, a revolutionary mood and a revolutionary mindset. The, I think the important point that Telma was making in her keynote was that it's more difficult to say what linguistic knowledge would look like for ELF, uh, that we must go beyond the syllabus design. And there's clear evidence of this everywhere. You see reference, we, we, increasingly, we see reference to ELF. It appears in syllabus documents, but it doesn't appear necessarily in practice because, partly because we haven't really um, being able to do as much critical thinking as we, we need to in, in, at an institutional level. So in conclusion, I think when reflecting on what ELF means in practice, teachers identify with English in complex ways. So there might be difference as we've seen in that case study with the, with the participant Neelam, there might be differences between how they identify with the language as speakers and how they identify with it professionally as teachers. And this can really complicate attempts to instigate change in practice. It's a complex uh, question. Teachers are keen to critically examine shared practices in language pedagogy. In my experience, when they're asked to speak, to think critically about language um, and beliefs about methodology, they do so, they, they are very willing to do so, but critical reflection is very challenging. It requires long-term investment. It's a, it has to become a key component of their epistemic repertoires. It's, it, it has to be, become part of their skill set um, as thinking professionals. Now, a crucial, as a result of this, it's crucial that in language teacher education, we need to expose teachers and teacher educators to the more dynamic, emergent properties of language. We need to promote systematic reflection on existing linguistic norms, but also methodological norms, and explore opportunities for developing a more dynamic impression of language and communication. And then finally, change in teachers' beliefs and attitudes does not always lead to change in pedagogic practice. But I've been seeing this in my work for many years now. So ultimately, it's really important that teachers become involved in the research, that, that researchers develop uh, collaborative classroom-based research projects, and that we promote action research. That's crucial, really important. And I think the Enrich project is a fantastic example of how this can work. Um, and I haven't looked at it yet, but I'm really looking forward to downloading the Enrich handbook, and I will be highlighting this to my students. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. I'm going to stop there. Thank you.